Can you hear me? I'm hearing some echo, but... Well, it, it's a... Uh, is it too loud? No, that's good. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and... under the auspices of the dynasty founder... Oops. Under the auspices of the Dynasty Foundation, uh, which I had the pleasure to uh, come and lecture uh, a few years ago, uh, and uh, a foundation whose work I admire. Uh, as Mark said, I'm going to talk, indeed, about the future of physics, or more precisely, what we don't know. Because the future of physics is clearly the, defined by the questions that we are now asking nature to explain to us by what we don't know. The future is trying to understand what we don't know. As a physicist, I'm very proud of what we do know. And we know an enormous amount, much of which we have learned during my lifetime. During the last 50 years, for example, we constructed a comprehensive theory, discovered and understood the basic building blocks of all matter and all the forces that act on them. I'll describe a bit of that theory, the standard model, but broadly speaking, it describes the, what ordinary matter is made of. As you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, people realized that ordinary matter is actually made of atoms. And in the beginning of the century, we studied the structure of atoms and invented a new and bizarre theory called quantum mechanics to explain how atoms are constructed. We identified the electron and understood how atoms work due to the force of electricity that holds the electron in place as it orbits a very small nucleus at the center of the atom. In this, towards the end of the 20th century, we understood the structure of the nucleus, made out of protons and neutrons, which turned out as we understood more, to be made out of quarks. Proton, for example, is made out of two kinds of quark we call up quark and one down quark, three quarks, held together by the nuclear force. We understood that within the atom and within the nucleus there are three forces whose structure we now understand in great detail. They are the forces of electromagnetism, electricity, that holds the electron in place, and the strong and weak nuclear force that act within the nucleus, hold the quarks together in the proton. We have learned a lot in the last 50 years. We have mapped the entire history of the universe from its beginning, now known to an incredible accuracy, 13.7 billion years ago, until now. We have reconstructed the history of the universe. And 50 years ago, None of this was known 
It was only speculation. But now we have a picture of how the universe, shortly after it began, that we don't understand, until now has evolved. We have achieved exquisite understanding and control of matter in all of its different phases. Liquids, solids, gases, conductors, insulators, superconductors, down to the scale of atoms. That's the basis of all of our modern technology. And the impetus for future technologies that will surely be developed in the 21st century. So as physicists, as scientists, we are very proud and astonished if we look back 50 years ago and realize how much we have learned, how much understanding and control we have achieved in only 50 years, less than the lifetime of a single man. However, that doesn't mean that physics has no future, that physics has come to an end, because we are embedded in an ocean of ignorance. And the more we learn, the more our knowledge expands, the more we are aware of what we don't yet understand of what we don't know. And it is that ignorance, actually, that pushes us forward and makes sure that we still have a job to do. We still have an exploration to complete. I like to say that the most important product of knowledge is ignorance. I, of course, don't mean the ignorance that leads to racism and bigotry and war and bad elections, but ignorance that provides a informed, intelligent ignorance. New questions, new mysteries, questions that can be answered by observation, by experiment and by theory. Scientific questions, well-posed scientific questions. The marvelous thing about well-posed scientific questions is that once we are able to ask well-posed scientific questions, then we can try to answer by observation or by experiment or by mathematical theory, or by all of these methods together, which make up the scientific method, those questions are usually answered, often much quicker than we have any reason to hope. That's what makes science so exciting. So I am giving you the latest version of a, a talk I give I've been giving for some years on a list of questions that might guide physics over the next 25 years. You know, in science, it's not difficult to predict the future, to predict what advances, what will happen in the next 25 years. Because once you know these questions, once you know how to ask them correctly, it's easy to predict what will happen in 25 years. The questions will be answered. It's much harder to predict what new technologies will emerge even from the science we already know, because new technology depends not just on nature, but on humans and what they want and what it costs. So, 
But the future of physics is easy to predict once you know the right questions. And I'm going to discuss some of these questions in physics. And by physics, I mean a broad set of fields of science, ranging from cosmology and astrophysics to the physics of ordinary matter, condensed matter physics, particle physics, the physics of elementary particles, string theory, biophysics, biology. These are all fields that physicists work on. Physicists actually are so arrogant and successful that they feel they can do anything that's of interest, that is therefore called physics. Because I don't want to talk for two hours, I'll actually maybe only talk about 15 questions. Let me start with the first question, which appropriately is the beginning of the lecture and the beginning of the universe. How did the universe begin? As I told you, we know a lot about the total history of the universe, which spans 13.7 billion years. We don't really know how it began. But we know that 13.7 billion years ago, it was a, it was very, the complete universe that we can see today, which is about 13.7 billion light years big, back then was very, very small very, very hot, and it expanded very rapidly, and then settled down to a continual, almost constant rate of expansion. We have a baby picture of the universe about a few hundred thousand years after the beginning. At that point, atoms formed out of the gas of electrons and protons, and light could escape and stream out. And it has been doing so for the last 13 and a half billion years. That light, which started out very hot, cooled down as the universe expanded, and we still see it today. If you have an old television set, you turn it on, and nothing, you're not receiving any channel, you see all this noise. Half of that noise is the light that is streaming from 13, 0.7 billion light years away from the time in which this very hot gas let its light go on its way. And this is what it looks like. Totally boring, hot gas, which physicists say is black body radiation. This is the spectrum of that microwave background, a perfect black body as Max Planck predicted uh, at the end of the 19th century. In the last 20, 30 years, however, we have looked at this black body radiation with exquisite precision to see whether there's any difference in this radiation from point to point. If there were not, it would be hard to understand how structure developed in the universe. And indeed, it turns out that if you look carefully, you see 
a map which looks more like this, in which these are hot spots and these are cooler spots. The difference in temperature between these two different spots is only one part in 10,000. But that's enough for gravity to begin to work. These regions are hotter, they have more mass, they begin to collapse gravitationally, condense, and astrophysicists, cosmologists can now explain how this picture of the universe 13.6 billion years ago, 13.7 billion years ago, under the, just the force of gravity that pulls slightly denser regions together, eventually forms galaxies. This is a picture of the structure that emerges, these filaments of denser matter with the galaxies being these little over-dense regions here and here and here. These are all galaxies. That's what, when you go out at night, you look up in the sky, you see these regions that emit light. We actually have a very good quantitative understanding of how galaxies emerge. Stars are formed and burn, and they clump together to form galaxies. We understand things up to today. And we have learned in the last 10, 15 years, something that suggests that the future of the universe might be quite different. We've discovered that was the, this year's Nobel Prize. Astronomers have discovered that the universe is, ex that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. And if that continues, it will get bigger, bigger, faster and faster, and I'll discuss the implications of that in a moment. But at the moment, the question I'm asking is, well, how did it all begin? The what is the Big Bang? And if that is the place that our equations break down. The equations of Einstein, who first understood that space and time itself are dynamical and gave us the tools to understand the history of the universe. His equations break down if we go back to the beginning. String theory, a different and more powerful approach, hopes to answer that kind of question, but so far, again, we haven't been able to understand what is the Big Bang? So that is the first question that clearly is now well formulated and we can try to answer a question like this now, not as a religious or metaphysical question, but this is now a scientific question. We can try to get signals, observations, of the physics very close to the Big Bang. For example, people are now trying to observe in that microwave background, in the light, the pattern of light that we see, signals that would be evidence for fluctuations, for dynamical fluctuations of space-time itself, very close to the Big Bang. But can we use that information to actually explain how the universe began? Physics has never had to explain such things before. We simply say, okay, we know what the world is like now, we can predict the future. 
But how can you have a understanding or a theory, scientific, of how the universe began? We don't know. And it's hard to imagine such a theory. People have problems imagining how did time begin? If the universe began at some point, 13.7 billion years ago, what was there before the universe began? Was there a time before the Big Bang? Some people think the universe didn't begin then. It was cyclic. Expands and expands and forever. I suspect that our notions of space and time are only approximate and that we don't even, in the case of asking this question, know how to correctly ask the question. We have to learn how to ask the question in a way that has a reasonable answer and a predictive answer. That's question number one. The second two questions have to do with the content of the universe. What is the universe made of? The universe has all of these, we are made out of particles, electrons and quarks, as I told you. And then there's radiation, which has energy. What is the mass and the energy of the universe? Well, one of the remarkable discoveries of the last 30 years Again, one of the implications of the observations that led to this year's Nobel Prize is that most of the energy of the universe is something called dark energy, which sounds very mysterious. And most of the matter, most of the particles, the matter in the universe is something we're not sure what it is, and we call it dark matter. So, the next two questions are, what is the nature of the dark matter and the dark energy that fill the universe? So, let's start with dark matter. How do we know what is dark matter? This is a fantastic story because this is a discovery of matter not made by scientists in a laboratory looking through a microscope or particle accelerators, but astronomers looking at galaxies like uh, the Milky Way. And they measured the velocity of stars, the outer rims of these galaxies, and using Kepler's laws or Newton's laws, if you know the velocity of the star and its distance from the center of the galaxy, you can calculate how much mass there is that's holding the star in orbit. And what they discovered was that there was missing mass. They couldn't, if you added up all of the mass of the stars that you can see with your eye, visible matter, it's not enough to hold these stars in their orbits. So there was missing matter, dark matter, and this is the picture they have of our galaxy. It's a big ball of dark matter. Particles, a gas, sort of. And the stars and the planets are just in the center of this big ball of matter, there's 90 times, 90% 90 of the mass is in, in this dark matter, which we don't see. We just infer, we just deduce from the laws of gravity. There's another way of seeing dark matter, and that is through what is called gravitational lensing. If you, Einstein's theory predicts that light passing by the sun will be attracted to the sun and will bend. The sun as, acts like a lens and light coming from behind the sun will be bent around the sun. 
That was the first test of Einstein's theory, the observation of the bending of light by the sun. Well, if there's dark matter in the universe, we can see it or deduce it by looking at the bending of light that comes from some object behind the dark matter. And we can come up with pictures like this. This is an amazing event that we've taken a picture of that happened a few billion years ago when two clusters of galaxies, this is a collection, of, not of stars, but of galaxies. Each of these clusters contains maybe a thousand galaxies, some of the brightest ones. The gas, you can see this red stuff is hot gas surrounding those galaxies. What you see here, these bright spots, are galaxies that are behind this cluster. And the blue stuff is the amount of dark matter which you can calculate because it bends the light coming from these galaxies behind it. So, for example, you see double images of a single galaxy because of the bending of light as it comes at you from different ways. Now, what happened a few billion years ago was that this cluster of galaxy collided with this cluster of galaxies. And now they're separating again. They went through each other. The red stuff is ordinary particles. And ordinary particles interact strongly. And there's a bit of friction. The blue stuff is the dark matter, which doesn't feel the same friction, so it goes faster. And now the Galaxies are not at the center of the dark matter. If you take the same picture a billion years from now, the red stuff will have fallen into the center of the blue dark matter. So we have visible matter we can see with light, and dark matter, much more of it, that we can only deduce from the laws of gravity. But what is it made of, this dark matter? Well, one way to answer that is to detect the dark matter wind that exists right here in this room. The Earth is moving at about 500 kilometers a second through this halo of dark matter. That means that there's a wind of dark particles, according to this, our expectations, observations, theory. There are about 500 dark matter particles passing through each of you every second, moving at 500 kilometers a second. And you don't feel anything. And that's the problem. If you did feel it, then we could have detected the dark matter. But dark matter interacts, it appears, very, very weakly. And therefore, it's hard to detect. These particles just go through you. And we have instruments deep down underground, very sensitive, that, where we're looking for that dark matter wind. And we have much hope of detecting that wind during the next 10 years. Another way of understanding dark matter is to produce it in the laboratory. Einstein taught us that energy is the same as mass. If you have enough energy, you can create particles and they're antiparticles. So if I have enough energy, 
I can make dark matter. Most of the particles we've discovered in nature uh, don't live around us because they are unstable. Dark matter might not, it's hard to produce because there, it requires so much energy. We have reasons to believe, however, that based on the amount of dark matter and its properties, that we're beginning with the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva at CERN to get to the energies where we might make this dark matter in the laboratory. So this is the way we could experimentally confirm the existence of dark matter and study its properties. What about the dark energy? What is that? And how could we learn about it? It is responsible, that's how it was discovered, for the expansion, the accelerated expansion of the universe. But what is it? Well, in Einstein's theory of gravity, which explains that gravity is really the ripples in the fabric of space and time. Space and time are not just inert frames, but uh, dynamical objects. And the metrical, the distance, the metrical structure of space-time is dynamical, and that gives rise to gravity. In Einstein's theory, there was a natural element that he didn't particularly need, although he used it once, which, in a sense, is what is called, therefore, the Einstein's cosmological constant, and I'll explain where it might come from, but it gives rise automatically to this kind of accelerated expansion of the universe. If that's the explanation, and we don't know, then the universe might continue this acceleration forever. The acceleration is the fact that galaxies, faraway galaxies, are moving away from us with a velocity that is bigger and bigger as we go out farther, and is getting bigger and bigger in an accelerated fashion. That's a very depressing thought. If the universe continues to accelerate this way in about 15 billion years from now, if you go out at night and look up at the sky, not in Moscow where you can't see the stars or the galaxies, but out somewhere on the top of a mountain, instead of seeing all those galaxies and stars throughout the universe, you'll just see black sky. The only thing that will be visible, the whole universe, will be the milk, our galaxy, which is held together. The other galaxies will have, space will have stretched in an accelerated way, and they will be traveling faster than the speed of light relative to us. Now that might seem impossible. Nothing, including neutrinos, can travel faster than the speed of light. But they're not, this is space itself is expanding in such a way that those points, those distant galaxies, if they send light to us, space expands so fast that that light never comes to us. The universe will be very dark and lonely. And eventually, even the galaxy will evaporate and space will expand, and eventually every quark, every atom, will be alone in its separate part of the universe. So, well, we don't know. The question here is not how the universe began, but how will it end?
The third question is about this cosmological constant. If that's the answer, what is it? Where does it come from? Where does this energy come from? Well, in a sense, it is the energy of empty space. And it is a very funny kind of energy. You must have heard that people used to believe that empty space was filled with something called the ether. And then Einstein showed that the ether isn't there. There is no ether. What was strange about the ether filling all of space, people thought you needed something like the ether to explain light. Light was the vibration of the ether. They thought that if you have waves, they have to be waves of something. The something was the ether. But the ether picks out what we call in physics a particular frame of reference. For example, this room is filled with air. And, you know, I'm, the air is more or less at rest. I don't feel any wind. But if I start walking, I feel a wind. If I'm moving, then the air is not at rest with respect to me. It's moving. So I can tell whether I'm moving or not. Right? I can, if I'm moving, I feel the wind. But physics teaches us, and Einstein emphasized, that physics is the same for all observers, whether they're at rest or moving at a constant velocity. And therefore, there can't be anything like the ether where I can tell the difference whether I'm at rest or moving. I feel the ether wind. So if I say that space has energy, normal kind of energy depends on whether you're moving or not. If I'm at rest, I have no kinetic energy. If I'm moving, I have energy, I can tell that, but if I hit somebody else, I feel it. However, it turns out that there's one kind of stuff that looks the same in all respects to observers who are standing still or who are moving with constant velocity. It's a kind of stuff that has energy, all right, but it also has pressure, you know, the kind of pressure that stops you from pushing a balloon that pushes out. Well, this is a kind of pressure that pushes in, negative pressure. And I don't, I've never been able to figure out a way to explain this without mathematics, but this strange stuff, energy and negative pressure, looks the same to an observer at rest or an observer moving with constant velocity. It is stuff with energy, but not ether. Stuff that looks the same in all frames of reference. The same to all observers. It's very strange stuff, but very natural in Einstein's theory. And that kind of vacuum energy energy of space, not coming from matter or particles or radiation, just from space itself, causes this accelerated expansion. The universe is something like the surface of a balloon that you're blowing up, and every point on the balloon gets farther and farther away from the other points on the surface of the balloon. But Accelerated expansion means you're not blowing up the balloon at the same rate, but at an accelerated rate. So, if that's where, oops, what happened? If that's where the, uh, 
God. So it could be that the vacuum is the source of the dark energy. But you might find that strange to believe because the vacuum, what's the vacuum? Just nothing, right? This is the picture that most people have of the vacuum. It's what's left over if you get rid of everything else. No atoms, no particles, no fields, no nothing. Just vacuum, boring vacuum. And that was the classical picture of the vacuum. But we learned only 80 years ago that the world is not so simple. It's governed by a strange mechanics called quantum mechanics with weird properties from a classical point of view. And one of the weird properties is that nothing is ever at rest in the quantum world. If you observe something, you invariably interact with it and set it moving. And the quantum vacuum is full of moving quantum fields, fluctuating fields. This is a good picture and virtual particles that come into existence and then annihilate. This is a this picture oops, of the uh, quantum vacuum at the scale, the size of a proton, the nuclear scale, using the theory of the strong nuclear force, which dominates at this scale. So if you want to have a picture in your mind, if you had a very good microscope of what nothing looks like, what the vacuum looks like, this is much better than that white blank sheet. It's full of fluctuating quantum fields and virtual particles that pop in and out of existence. A lot is going on in the vacuum. In fact, much of what we've learned about this, the forces of nature and their strange properties are really consequences of the properties of the strange medium, the strange kind of stuff that the quantum vacuum is. So, by the way, as uh, Mark said in his introduction, I'll tell you a bit about what asymptotic freedom is that we got the Nobel Prize for. It too is a consequence of the strange properties of the quantum vacuum. It explains why if you take two quarks and try to pull them apart, Although, at very short distances, when the quarks are close together, the force is very, very weak. As you pull them apart, the quantum vacuum leads to the force getting stronger, not weaker. Just the opposite of what you would naively think. And that's called asymptotic freedom. And it was the attempt to understand why, on the one hand, quarks, when you look at them at short distances, appear to move freely, and at the other hand, you can never pull a quark out of a proton that led us to discover the theory that could explain that, which has this property of asymptotic freedom. And the theory is called quantum chromodynamics. It is a theory of quarks held together by a kind of force like electricity and magnetism, but with three kinds of charge, not just one. And in that theory, which you can now do the calculation, what happens when you pull the quarks apart? The fields that hold the quarks together are squeezed by the quantum vacuum to these tubes, and that means that 
It requires an infinite amount of energy to pull a quark out of the proton, which was, explains why we've never seen quarks. This is not what you see in a microscope. This is what a theorist sees in a computer simulation of what happens when quarks are pulled apart. But with a theory, you can calculate, for example, the mass of the proton, the mass of the neutron. We can now calculate to 1% the masses of the particles that make us up. Now, when you get the Nobel Prize, you get a bunch of things. You have dinner with the Queen of Sweden, and the King gives you a check. But one of the nicest things is a document which contains a picture drawn by an artist symbolizing your discovery. In this case, you see the proton of which you are made out of. You see these three quarks tied together by this chromodynamic force, which is so strange due to the properties of the vacuum. They also make a poster, and here you, with a cute picture of three quarks inside the proton trying to escape. I'm very unhappy because they're held together by this strong force. But the Swedes got it wrong. This isn't what it looks like. If you do the calculation, this is what it looks like when you pull the quarks apart. Doesn't look like a triangle of flux, but rather a triad. But it's because of the quantum vacuum pulling, pushing the field lines in that you, your protons don't turn into quarks. And why we don't have quark currents flowing in wires. It would be very interesting if we did, but that's not the way the quantum vacuum works. Well, all of these fields fluctuating in the vacuum have energy, you can see, right? All that moving stuff has energy, right? Obviously. In fact, in quantum mechanics, from the beginning, it was always a mystery. Why isn't there an enormous vacuum energy, an enormous cosmological constant, an enormous expansion of the universe? When you try to do a calculation, you find an astoundingly large energy compared to what is now observed. This is a big mystery. We understand that it is almost impossible to avoid the existence of a vacuum energy which would make the universe expand more rapidly. What we don't understand is the magnitude. Why is it so small? And this, in a sense, is the biggest theoretical problem that theorists face. What is the reason it's so small? Some of my colleagues have been led to desperate explanations. They say, we, this is impossible to explain. Therefore, it must be the case that there are billions and billions, trillions and trillions of universes that are produced by whatever it is that causes the Big Bang and inflation. And we just live in that one of those universes that has such a small cosmological constant that the universe doesn't expand fast enough, galaxies can form, life can form. In the other ones, the cosmos.